What's good, what's good? This is Tony A with Your Body. If this is your first time on my channel, definitely let me know which country you're repping. And also hit the subscribe button and the little bell right next to it, right next to it, so that you can get alerted when I do drop new videos. All right, so let's go ahead and get into it. So as you see the title, this video is just gonna be a case study on a Nigerian lady that is displaying some Nigerian excellence, some African excellence, and she was able to create a million dollar business. And she started being an employee for a company that was in the same industry. So I like the story a lot just because it showed how she was in one position, just a lower position, regular employee, just working. And she had the knowledge and wisdom to understand, hey, there's there's a lot more wealth around me than just this paycheck that I'm getting. I need to do something more. She went ahead, did it, and now she's doing exceedingly well. I actually posted a screenshot of, of her story on my Instagram. So if you're not following me on Instagram, my handler is right there on the screen. So there you, there you have it. Follow me on Instagram. A lot of times I try to post just content that gets us thinking and some, some good stuff. So anyway, so I posted just a screenshot of what she, she did. And now in this one, I'm actually gonna, I wanna break down just section by section of what she was doing differently that I see a lot of people don't do. Now, she's being interviewed and the, the person is asking her questions and she's just describing the whole journey. And that's where I, I can see there's a lot of nuggets inside and some of this stuff i actually talked about before in my in my previous videos as far as how you become successful and just like business and really knowing your craft and just knowing the industry so you're going to see in this video how uh i'm just going to point out some of the stuff that she's saying i haven't read the full article so i'm going to be reading it along with you and i'm going to be new to it and i'm just going to I, I want you to kind of understand what I see so that maybe this can be helpful to you when you're going on your own journey of doing business in, in West, West Africa or even Africa. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and share the screen so that you all can see what I see. All right, cool. So as you see the title, Supply and Nestle with Cassava products, how this Nigerian entrepreneur built her agri processing business. So immediately what stands out to me, I'm gonna make this a little smaller. So what stands out to me is she's not just, she's thinking about the value chain. So when I see processing, processing is where the money is when it comes to agriculture. It's not just farming. And a lot of times, from what I've seen, we when we think of agriculture, we just think of farming and growing like um, uh, cassava, uh, tomatoes, eggs, poultry, like just the the big the start of it. But we're not thinking about the finished product, the end product. So, but be, be, between the start of the farm, um, the farming, and then the finished product, there's a lot of stuff that goes on in between in order to give that finished product its value so immediately when i see the agar processing i'm like okay this is this is dumb this is definitely going to be some good stuff so go back just make it bigger for you all to see all right so i'm going to go ahead and read along and i'm going to start just catching some stuff that i see so this is the summary right here and once again i actually made uh i took a screenshot of this and posted it to my social media account, my IG account. So once again, if you're not following me, definitely follow me on that account. So, yeah, Missy, I run Loye. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm, I'm not the best at pronouncing my own people's names, but I'm learning. So she conceived the idea for Pulse Tree International, a cassava processing company. In 2005 at the time she was an employee an employee at a firm where she worked extensively with cassava and was exposed to the crops commercial potential while still an employee 
She paid intermittently for her first piece of land upon which she later developed her farm and factory. Within 10 years, the business has grown from 600 million Naira to over 5 billion Naira in revenue per annum. So the first thing that set her apart from a lot of other people is that she worked a lot of hours. Apparently she worked a lot and she still was thinking, okay, there has to be, there's something more. So even though she's she's working with a product, she's she's involved with it all the time, she's getting her skills. So now think about all the hours we spend in our own jobs, especially if we don't really care for it that much. If it doesn't inspire us to be a better person or in society, all the hours that we spend in that job, it could either go to waste or it can go it can be an investment in ourselves that we don't really see it yet for us to do something great in the in the future so i'm sure she made mistakes and she was just doing things that didn't make any sense but she made her mistakes on the company's dime so she wasn't making mistakes on her own she was making it on the company's dime she got trained on the company's dime and then she took that experience and now she created her own company that's how you do poweronomics you get the experience and then you have to understand that this is not the end goal this is not the end game there's something greater for me than this or even if you don't want to start a business you can always do consulting something where you had that financial flexibility or or the financial freedom and the flexibility to do what you want to do for the most part so Anyway, so that's what she did. She was working with that company and developed her factory. All right. So give us an overview of what Upholstery International does. So Upholstery International Limited produces food, grade starch, and high quality cassava flour. And we now have the first cassava-based sorbet sole factory in Nigeria. We grow the cassava ourselves and also buy from local small smallholder farmers. Food grade starch has almost 300 applications in the food industry and is used largely by beverage companies and for seasoning, noodles, and pastries. Sorbitol is used in toothpaste, pharmaceutical drugs, and high-end drinks because it's a healthier sweetener than cane sugar. Our clients are Unilever, Nestle, Nigerian Breweries, and Promisordia, to name a few. So what I'm looking from here, this is where the processing comes into play because you can you can make so much money if you're thinking about the value chain. So just starting with cassava, stuff that we eat all the time, fufu, whatever, has more applications than just eating it. You can use it in pharmaceuticals and you can you can use it for seasoning like you see the applications you can use it for so even if you want to branch out into one area you can and it starts with the cassava buying the cassava is freaking cheap then you have to think about okay how can i add value to get the the outcome the, whether financial or whatever that i want so i mean this is this is amazing i didn't know that it was that many applications for for uh, cassava. Uh, tell us about, tell us about your history before. So I finished my degree in food biochemistry from the Federal University of Technology, MENA, in 1997 and completed my master's in biochemistry and nutrition from the U University of Ibadan in 2000. I started as an entrepreneur formulating food for di diabetic patients using wheat and making natural drinks. In 2001, I moved over to Eka Agro Processing Limited, a company that uses cassava to produce glucose syrup. I spearheaded that project, and it was where I fell in love with the crop. I stayed with the company for 10 years and left to start this business. So one thing to keep in mind now, this is for a lot a lot of people that are back home in Nigeria. I made a video about this where when she graduated, she was thinking of entrepreneurship, not looking for a job. 
Now, this is back in 2000. I'm trying to remember how the economy was doing. Then I think it was decent. Don't quote me on it, but I think it was doing decent. But anyways, she had the mindset that, hey, look, I'm going to try to start some type of business on my own rather than looking to apply for a job. Now, because she had that experience, I bet applying for this job, she was able to get it because of her experience already versus someone that just came out of school and started working. So there goes, uh, there's a tip right there. It's all about your skill set. If even if you just want to work a job, is what skills are what valuable skills do you have that a company can utilize and make money off of it? That's that's the whole point. And companies hiring people, they need people to make them a profit. And if you don't have any skills like that, and you ain't making them a profit, then why are they gonna choose you just because you took some some courses in college? Nah, they don't. That that don't mean nothing as much to them. They they want someone with skills. All right, so describe the early days of the company. After 10 years with Echo Agro, Agro, I relocated to the farm in Oil State. I came here from Lagos, built a small house, and stayed on the farm with about six staff. We cultivated the land and worked with smallholder farmers in the community. We engaged with them to change their thinking from farming only for fufu, a West African food made up out of cassava, or Gary granulated cassava to farming for industrial purposes. Okay, that's that's what's up. It's two things I'm noticing from here. I'm going I'm to continue on. I'm going to just read this whole section. Okay, yeah, I'll read this whole section. I already knew my success parameters, raw materials, and proximity to the raw materials, not the proximity to the market because I can easily move my finished goods but my raw materials are not as simple. I also knew quality was going to open doors to the various buyers. Nestle took samples from our first batch and was our very first customer within two weeks of production. Wow. They had witnessed our journey and already knew the kind of quality we were going to produce. Not many people in Nigeria were producing good quality starts at the time and Nestle certified us within two or three weeks. Nigerian breweries followed and from there, our business grew. All right. So what I'm noticing, so there's really three things. The first one is she went over to Oil State and she stayed full time where she was going to be. And she already had a staff of six people. So in my head, I'm thinking, OK, so she already got the funds to have six employees. This is in Nigeria. So. Over here, getting six employees or having a staff like that is going to thousands of dollars. But I don't know how much she saved up. That doesn't say. But the fact that she has six employees as a small business, in my head, I'm already I'm already thinking. Yo, it the 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 the, the cost to hold on, the cost to get in this field and and start start um. Start making money is, is not that high. The, the capital requirements can't be that high if you're already if you're able to have six staff and you're just starting out. So that's the first thing I noticed from that. Like, OK, so money. I, I mean, I already knew this, but if, if I'm just, a you know, someone that's just seen this, I'm like, OK, well, the barrier, the cost barrier seems to not be much of an issue. So then uh, cultivated the land and work with the small holder farmers. OK, so that's the second one. She made sure to get the community involved in some way so that now it's it's not just her doing everything and her entity doing everything. No. Now other people got skin in the game and you want to see the best for this company. So it's a really good move where when you get other people involved, when you get the community involved, everyone wants to see success. So, and then they're just going to keep working hard. And then at the same time, they're learning some skills and that just helps the community. So it's not like you just come in, do whatever you want to do, rob or not rob, but just exploit the, the, the land and then leave. That's what a lot of foreigners would do. But so I, li I like the fact that she, 
she's involving the the community and she's trying to train them on how to think more efficiently how to think more profitable instead of just starting at the base of just farming no there's more you can do there's more value in this whole industry if you just change your mindset a little bit so the fact she had she had the patience to do that uh she knew her her yeah her parameters the raw materials so she already did her due diligence she knows the the environment that she's working at this is something that that can, you can apply to your own life really as far as if you're trying to go into africa in this case we talk about west africa but whatever africa then you have to do your due diligence and you have to understand where your parameters are at what you need to do get involved with the local economy the people that way you're it it, it limits your risk because now you're you're there's more other people involved in this process and you're the brains of the operation so you're an integral part they can't knock you out because you're doing more than just farming so now it's just like no they need you there and it's just it it's great synergy so it was one more thing she did oh well it's an obvious thing quality so just being honest when it comes to a lot of these a, a lot of african companies the quality customer service is poor i've experienced it myself and a lot of my friends experienced it themselves quality is poor so the 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 standard barrier is already the barrier is set low so if you come in with just basic requirements for yourself in order to produce a product you're already having the advantage because your standard of quality is higher than a lot of 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 the the, the other people in your industry so she was already standing out you got a big old company an international company like nestle is looking at her and just like okay well we'd rather go with you because these other companies don't have quality product like you you actually know what you're doing we're gonna we're gonna go bang with you even though you're a small company you only got six people no we're going with you so that can be you as well if you come over there and you're on your stuff and, and you know your product you know your industry and you're you're giving value quality product then people are going to mess with you rather than anyone else so that was the last one. I'm going to make this bigger. All right. So what has been the biggest challenges in the early days? This is a rural area, so there was no power. We started with generators. I chose this location because there was ample land and the community was welcoming. Our only water source was a small stream that dried up in the, in the dry season. However, there was a dam 15 kilometers away, a kilometers around six miles, six to eight miles, I think, which we could pipe to our factory eventually. To cope with the water source um, shortage, we built boreholes first for the community in 2011, then for the factory itself. The farmers realized we meant business once we built boreholes in the rocky environment. They were delighted and welcomed us with so much warmth. At the time, the road was poor. The small village was in the middle of this vast area. Sorting out transport and convincing staff to come and work here were all challenges we had to face. Currently, our biggest challenges are raw materials and funding. The banks do not understand the way the funding cycle of this business works. For example, every year you must plan for the next year because it's a 12-month crop. You need a budget to support the crops you will cultivate this year which you will only harvest next year. When buying the inputs you need for farming, you have to pay within 24 hours, but when you sell the finished product, you don't get paid for 60 days. There's a constant outflow of cash with a very slow return rate. These are things you need to explain to the financial institutions. This industry needs heavy working capital. So it looks like I stand corrected from the beginning. Well. Maybe starting out, it's not that much uh, capital required, but they're doing, because they're processing. So yeah, that equipment and the power, because the generators, all they, yeah, all that power that they need for the generators is gonna, it's gonna soak it up. So, okay, so what do I see here? Rural 
area. I'm sure I will hope that she really factored that in into her planning as far as the power source, because this ain't no stupid lady. So I'm sure she was already thinking about that. And the generator, so my my what what comes to mind is how can I balance generator use with solar panels? That's what I'll be thinking. Because there's a lot of solar panel companies in Nigeria. So that's something I'll be thinking in my head. Okay. I might not be able to do everything off of solar panel, but you know, at least if I can cut down the cost of, of using the using the gas or uh, the, the generators, then that should be fine. Uh, the water source. So here, I like the fact that they built the boreholes for the community because now the community is just like, just like she said, this is, I mean, of course they're going to welcome them because they're doing something, they're giving back to the community. And now they really want to see this company do well because it benefits them too. So they went ahead, did what they need to do. So they reinvested back into the business. So when they built their own boreholes and the road. So my thing, what, what I'll look at as, as a long-term investment in this situation is creating roads for my truck in order in, until and build it so that it meets the main road, which is better. But that's just a long-term investment. That's just in my head. You need a lot of money and funds for that and manpower. So that's, that's not much they can really do right now. The financing, this is one thing that I do think about when it comes to just doing anything. And in Africa, I'm not expecting uh, these banks to give financing because it seems from what I've learned and, and, and gathered, they are very slow. And their interest rates are ridiculous. I think sometimes it's as high as 25% interest, which is ridiculous. And it's it's like, how can you expect these smaller businesses to thrive if you're charging that much interest? Now I can understand the risk to them. They're just saying like they're they're like, okay, well, all these businesses fail. They don't keep up good financial records. Uh, we wanna we want them to have more skin in the game, but then the the adverse effects is it stops businesses from growing. So she's starting to have problems for with herself when it comes to this. Now, I believe the best way to go about it or another option she's probably looking at is just getting angel investors. This is where you need private investors. And really, I wish there was like a community of us, even though this is Nigeria, but a community of us that, hey, all she gets to do is just pitch an idea to us out here, us in the diaspora, all the way. Say, hey, look, this is what I'm trying to do. The bank's not really helping. This is my financial statements, my financial records. You can send your old your own lawyers down so they can look at all the books to make sure everything's legit. If you want to invest in this, we can grow. Here's the return that you can get, average return, maybe like eight percent or something like that. And we can all win. All right, so it looks like I got cut off. So I apologize for that, but we're still on it. So we should be good now. All right, cool. Cord on. Yeah, all right. So uh, let's continue. So yeah, so we talked about that. All right, the next section. In the beginning, where did you obtain funding? Funding was a major challenge. All I had was this land. I presented many business plans and proposals to convince the bank this was the way to go. Fortunately, we received funding from the Central Bank of Nigeria called the Commercial Agriculture Credit Scheme. At a single digit interest rate, we used the funds to construct the first factory. Cool. Uh, then the following year, we assess more funding through the CBN's Agriculture Credit Guarantee Scheme Fund. This fund provides loans to farmers for up to 75% of the value of the collateral. We saw it as an advantage, even though it required us to provide a 100% collateral guarantee for the farmers. Because we had trusted them, having lived and worked with them for about two years, we felt we could put down the collateral for about 100 farmers. 
also under that scheme, when farmers pay back, they get what we call drawbacks. We got farmers to pay back 100% and CB and return about 40% of their interest. Damn. That encouraged them a lot and they were able to expand their farms. So these are the small holder farms delivering cassava. Okay, now this is what's up. And this is good. Currently we have more than 5,000 farmers in our network. So they were able to make the whole funding work and it's probably when those banks were seeing see this is the thing they 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 set themselves apart from just other other farmers or other companies i'm sure that they had their books in order just from her experience the fact that the, this bank was able to give them the funding that they need to expand and i've heard stories of how difficult banks can be her books must be in order and she's doing business in a way that is favorable to the banks. The banks feel like, okay, all right, we can work with them. They're doing a lot, they're doing a lot more than what we usually see. And we can get our investment pretty good. And we want them to grow because if they grow and we have a good relationship, well, then we're going to make money on the back end after that. So I like the fact that they was able to figure it out. And this is what happens when you come like, just because we're in a system that, for the most part works when it comes to business and we on this, we work for companies that have to keep good records in order for them to expand grow have employees have health insurance you know the human resources all that everything has to be in order taxes everything has to be in order for for them to continue on so when we work in these environments we get very you know we're comfortable take that mindset and bring it over to west africa and you're going to see how these financial institutions are going to treat you. They're going to be looking at you like, all right, well, you're coming from abroad. Your mindset is going to be different. All right, we've seen the way that you do your paperwork. Okay, all right, we, we feel more comfortable with you than, than the other ones. Well, everyone can still win because you're going to be employing the locals. Now, she got 5,000 farmers that are, that are eating off of her due diligence and her good work. And now she's providing for that's 5,000 farmers. Poss who knows how many families that is? I can be like 10,000 families, 20,000 families that she's helping get out of poverty. And that's the, that's why I love business so much. And I don't like the charitable, the charity mindset or the chair, the charitable system of just giving people stuff. No, it doesn't help them. These farmers are building skills and they're creating good work ethic so that they can pass it on to their children. They can provide the life that they want. And it's all meaningful, good quality work, good good food, good product, quality product. This is what it's about. So this is, this is amazing right here. All right. So I'm gonna keep scrolling down. I described the company's manufacturing process. All right, this should be interesting. It is a fully integrated system with full traceability from the farm to the way bridge. When the produce arrives at the weigh bridge, we test the cassava for starch content. It then goes for peeling, washing, milling, extraction, dewatering, and drying. If it is for starch, the cassava goes from peeling to washing, milling, dehydrating, flash drying, and into the disc feed feeder if it is for flour. Okay, that's self-explanatory. Very specific, understands the different processes of adding value and I'm curious about how much power she's using for this. Yeah, I'm, I'm, that's what I'm curious about, how much energy is she using, but okay. How do you deal with the challenge of transport infrastructure and logistics? Okay, it's difficult, but we have to live with it. The quality of roads is poor, so we use alternative routes, which take longer. We make sure our trucks travel slowly and at night when there's less traffic, they arrive at their destinations in the morning and discharge. Okay, you're trying to be innovative. You got a problem. You can't really solve it right now. You got to make pivots and you got to keep on moving. So tenacity right there. What are some of the trends you see in Nigeria's agribusiness sector? Right now, the agribusiness sector is suffering because of COVID-19. It affected a lot of companies because of the shortage of raw materials. 
We struggled as cassava is used in Gary production and Gary is one of the major elite products the government distributed during the pandemic. I foresee a situation where more people will go into the cultivation of raw materials and predict companies will spring up to provide food for the 200 million people in Nigeria. There's nothing we produce in this country that we cannot consume. We need to do more. Okay. So these are just situations in Africa that you just have to contend with. Like not everything, a lot of stuff is out of your hands. We know this. It's not just corruption. It's just the, the economy is fresh. But I mean, this is grounds for someone that is innovative and a trailblazer to go out and 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 get their get their uh, get their royalties at the same time helping the community. But this is this is where this is where the people uh, people that are not uh, uh, weak at heart can can get it done. All right. So if you had a chance to start Paul Street International again, what would you do differently? So I would have looked for an international fund to come with me. The road would have been easier. We're about to open up the company to more investors. Perhaps I should have done it at the beginning and we could have grown faster. So this was actually what I was saying earlier when, when she was having the... That's the end of the article. Yeah. So, yeah. So this is what I was saying earlier when she was having issues with just the funding. And I was like, man, if only she had like a network of, of us in the diaspora that she can go to and be like, hey, look, these are, I'm, I'm part of your program, whatever you can have a diaspora program. I'm applying. This is what I'm trying to do. We got the funds we have. Collectively, we have disposable income like no other. Like we got money, we got it. So I, I was saying, you know, she should have she would she should have been able to come to us, and then we would have funded, and then she could have um uh, grow faster, and wouldn't have to worry so much about the banks. So this is something that at least looking back is now she's saying is like, hey, I should have looked at international um, investors, but I mean she didn't know, but still, like what she's doing is is amazing. Now, for us, we have options where, I mean, we, we there's more stories like this. And I'm going to try to put out these stories and really do these case studies so that you all can understand what am I thinking when I see these opportunities or these stories? Like, how am I viewing it? What are some of the the, the, the trap holes or, or, you know, that that or, or the pit holes that that I'm going to try to avoid? What is the potential I'm seeing? I want I want you all to start to understand this is what it takes when you're trying to do business in, in, in Africa, where your mindset needs to be. It's not that the, the concept is, it's not so complicated, but you just got to be prepared and, and cover all your bases, which is obvious. But unfortunately, there's a lot of people that go over to, let's just say Nigeria, and they think just because they got the money, they're going to go in and then they're going to build something amazing. And they always or most of the time they lose their money. They're not doing the due diligence and they're just not coming with wisdom. So if it, it benefits all of us, if we're if we're doing quality work and also we're not naive and we we understand that, hey, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of nuances here. And the, the better prepared we are, the more we can do and we can alert the others that are trying to um, do business over in Africa, hey, don't do this, or this is my experience. Okay, don't do this. Now we, we, we got something on the books, we got something tangible that says, okay, we're seeing a consistent trend. Now we can avoid it and then get farther, you know, quicker to our, to our target. So I hope you all appreciate this breakdown, this case study. Uh, let me get her name one more time. Uh, Yamisi Iran Loyes story hopefully you you gain some 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 nuggets from it if you did like this like this video show some su support for the channel if you haven't already done so uh subscribe to my channel and if you know anyone else that's interested in, in just doing business in, in africa or just learning about stories or how they can do it share the story to them maybe it can be helpful if it's not as much helpful to you then it can possibly be helpful to somebody else so don't keep this video a secret share with somebody else. 
Until next time, you all stay blessed.